joining. Um, I, as I was just saying to Sam, I'm, I'm really excited by this presentation. Um, we will follow the usual format about 20 minutes presentation and then 10 minutes Q&A. Um, and I'll give you a sort of wave when you've got five minutes to go. Okay. Um, over to you. Thank you very much. So, uh, my name is Samia Touati. I'm doing a PhD uh, in France, École Pratique des Hautes Études, about humor in Islam in general. And I tried to look uh, at the question whether animals laugh or weep uh, in uh, Islamic sources. But as I didn't find much to say exactly about laughter and, and uh, weeping, I enlarged the discussion into emotions in, more, uh, in a broader way. Uh, well, one of the first things to know about laughter in the uh, uh, Quran is verse uh, 43 from Surah 53. And I gave you two translations just to say uh, the difficulty for translators to communicate uh, some meanings. The first, transla first translation by Pictol, and that he it is who makes laugh and makes weep. And the second translation by Shakir, and that he it is who makes between brackets, men laugh and makes them weep. As you can see, between brackets is something <coughs> which the translator has added because it made more sense to him. But the text in Arabic, when you look at the exact words, the term men doesn't exist. So uh, this is one of the major difficulties we have when we deal with religious uh, texts, especially Quran, which has a very elliptic style. It says very less things, uh, very few things, and saying less is saying more, because keeping this um, ambiguity uh, opens the door to many interpretations. And most of the commentaries by traditional uh, theologians on this uh, verse have understood that it is God who makes humans laugh and weep. But we still can find uh, some other interpretations, including other creatures, such as the sky, which can weep, for example, when it rains, or the uh, 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 thunder is considered as laughter of the uh, uh, clouds. So you, you, can, you can see more cosmic interpretations of laughter and uh, weeping. But um, let's see what is interesting concerning animals. The interpretation that uh, one of the uh, uh, theologians, Al-Mawardi, uh, uh, one of his interpretations of that verse, uh, he says, God has distinguished the human being among other animals by laughter and weeping the two of them at the same time. For this theologian, humans are not distinguished because they laugh only or because they weep only, but because they can do both. And he gives some uh, observations saying, it is said that apes are the only animals that laugh but do not weep, and camels are the only ones that cry but do not laugh. So what is interesting about this remark is that uh, the uh, uh, theologian includes animals in being uh, able to laugh and to weep. His observations of the context he lived in, he couldn't observe much more creatures, so he saw uh, camels weeping and uh, apes laughing. Maybe he could have extended that remark to other animals, but still he's sorting out humanity as being the only one who is capable of doing both at the same time. Um, now, regarding the non-humans, non-human animals, I would like to reflect on two uh, uh, verses of the Quran giving cornerstones of uh, uh, the, the, the way uh, believers 
should look at these creatures. The first one is verse 44 from Surah 17. The seven heavens and the earth and whosoever in them is extol him. Nothing is that does not proclaim his praise, but you do not understand their extolling. Surely he is all clement, all forgiving. I underlined whosoever and not whatever. And in, in the uh, uh, Arabic uh, word, there is a difference between who and what, just like in, in, uh, in English. And the dwellers of the heavens and the earth are here described by a word which includes uh, a consciousness and a feeling. So here in this uh, verse, humanity is told that it is not the only species that knows God and that uh, extols him. All creation joins in in the worshiping, but few humans are conscious of the other's uh, way of uh, uh, worshiping God. So it, it is a, a, a way of telling people, maybe you are not alone in this universe. And if you pay more attention, you will find fellow believers around you. The second verse I mentioned, 38 from Surah 6, no creature is there crawling on the earth, no bird flying with its wings, but they are nations like unto yourselves, or communities, or some translate even peoples like yourselves. So here, and then we have neglected nothing in the book, then to their Lord they shall be mastered. The, the last part of the verse we shall see in the end of, the, uh, of this presentation. So here again, everybody, every creature crawling on the earth or flying in the sky is belonging to a larger unity, to a larger community of beings. And you have a, we have a sense of belonging to humanity as a, a full uh, uh, species, but each one of us is a different individual within the community. So the same idea applies to animals. Animals are living in communities, but each animal has its own individuality within this community. So I think these two uh, verses have to be kept in mind when dealing with emotions in animals, because the difference between, we, we are not automats, we are not robots. We are uh, 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 creatures that have souls, and hu humans have souls, as do animals. So this, the existence of soul in us, uh, implies that we have different uh, interactions, and we can be subject to many emotions. And if you, we go back to the, sorry, if we go back to the first uh, uh, verse I started with, it is God who makes people or animals laugh or weep. Emotions are something considered uh, as belonging to God's action. Sometimes we don't know why do we feel that, that emotion. It is sent somewhere and we don't know why we are feeling uh, uh, in a certain way. So this does not exclude animals. Now, there is a very interesting story in the Quran about Prophet Solomon. And I just uh, um, outlined or underlined that for us, Solomon is 
a king and a prophet. And in Muslim th theology, prophets do not sin. Prophets are perfect human beings. So this is a very um, cute story. Uh, and Solomon had the, uh, a kingdom which was including jinns, that, that is, uh, spirits we, we, which are not very visible to human beings. It included animals, and it, it, it included the wind. So, and his hosts were mastered to Solomon, jinn, men and birds, duly disposed. Till when they came on the valley of ants, an ant said, O oh, ants, enter your dwelling places, lest Solomon and his hosts crush you, being unaware. But he, Solomon, smiled, laughing at, at its words, and he said, My Lord, dispose me that I may be thankful for thy blessing, etc. So what is interesting here is that the aunt has a feeling of uh, um, urgency, emergency, telling the other ants, beware of Solomon and his army. They are coming and they may crush you. So we, f we really feel the anxiety of the, uh, of the ant and the anticipation about a danger and also the communication between an ant and the other fellow ants. Uh, and in the interpretation, th there, this uh, uh, ex excerpt from the Quran has a lot of interpretations. And one of them which I found interesting, uh, we found, we, I find it in Al Qurtubi's uh, exegesis, Jami al Ahkam al Quran, and he cites Abu Ishaq al Thalabi. It is a long dialogue between Solomon and the ant. I just chose some, uh, uh, some sentences. Solomon told the, uh, the ant, did you fear my injustice? Because she said, lest Solomon and his hosts crush you. He said, why did you say uh, uh, Solomon and his army may crush you? Did you fear my injustice? Don't you know that I'm a prophet and being such, I am a just person? And she told him, didn't you hear that I said being unaware? <laughs> so she knows that he cannot crush an ant knowing that there is an ant. So she said being unaware. And then it goes further, very uh, deeply in uh, the teaching. She said, although I didn't mean the crushing of the bodies, but crushing the hearts, lest the ants wish to have what was granted to you, or be fascinated by this worldly life, or that looking at your kingdom might prevent them from extolling and glorifying God. The ant knows that other ants has as an intrinsic mission to worship God by what they do. But it feared that when looking at Sol Solomon and all his uh, decorum, they will be fascinated by that and forget to mention God. Do you see how deep the teaching is? And then Solomon, when he heard this answer from the aunt, told her, exhort me, teach me something. And uh, it's a long exhortion, so I just put one of the uh, points. She asked him, do you know why God subjugated the wind to you? It is to tell you that this worldly life is no more than a wind. So how can a prophet, who is the highest model for humanity, not learn from animals? Here, if prophets learn from animals, what should we normal human beings do? So a prophet can learn from animals. And uh, the, the story of Solomon goes on with uh, Hupu, who taught Suleiman, uh, Solomon the existence of Sheba and its queen. And uh, that's another story. I will not um, uh, start that story because it will be too long. So animals are presented as true monotheists. They know God and they have no uh, question about his existence. And they even are able to discuss religious and spiritual matters 
uh, at a very deep level. So, um, now, the question about emotions in animals. Of course, I put emotions in uh, brackets in, because this is anthropo... Oh, five minutes. Oh, <laughs> well, what I told you before was uh, based on Quran. Hadith are the traditions attributed to Prophet Muhammad, and we have many traditions, maybe in, in uh, the, the Q&A session I can be more in detail into this. We have many uh, um, stories that show animals to have emotions. So sometimes I, I'm asking whether it is joy or whether it is deference or whether it is sorrow or quest for fair treatment. If, you, if you'd like to, uh, I can go back to these uh, uh, stories later. So we have, for example, let me tell you the, the last one. A camel uh, the, saw the prophet and went to him weeping and complaining because its owners were overloading him. And the prophet told them, you know, this camel was complaining about your mistreatment. So these, camel, these uh, animals are uh, uh, your responsibility and you should treat them fairly. So we have th this text. The question is, emotions in animals. Uh, how can a camel feel that he is mistreated and know that the prophet can bring justice to him when complained to, um, uh, when he complained to him. Now, to, um, to go back to the conversation in the beginning with uh, uh, the presenter who was uh, just before me, I don't remember her name, uh, Ellen. Um, in Islam, the universal divine justice includes all creatures and even animals. If you remember the, the uh, verse 38 from Surah 6, the end, then to their Lord they shall be mastered. This is in re resurrection day, in judgment day, and animals will be resurrected. And there will be also justice among animals because some animals do injustice to others. And we have a, a, an explicit hadith that is a, a saying attributed to the prophet. Rights will certainly be restored to those entitled to them on the day of resurrection, to the point that even the hornless sheep will lay claim upon the horned one. If a horned sheep has attacked a hornless sheep, the day of judgment, there will be a reparation, and the right of that hornless sheep will be uh, given to, uh, uh, to make them even. So the day of judgment is the day where everything is put even, and it includes animals also. Thank you very much for your attention. So here is a list for further reading if you want. Thank you. Um, brilliant. Um, we have got a bit of time. Have we got any questions now, or would we like Sammy to go back to some of the... Yeah, maybe I, I went quickly to... Uh, one of the hadith sections, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. This, this one. So, uh, for the first one, Halima Sadia was, the, was uh, a nanny from a nomadic um, uh, tribe. She was not from Mecca. Prophet Muhammad was born in Mecca to a family, to a noble family of Mecca. Mecca is a city where many people come and is most of the time polluted because there are uh, a lot of people coming and going because of the pilgrimage. So Meccan families used to send their children, their baby bo children, to women in the Bedouin tribes to, breed fe to, to breastfeed them and so that they grow up in a, a pure air and they learn pure Arabic and, the, and, and many things. So, so Halima Sadia was one uh, of this tribe which came looking for a baby to care of. And when she came from her dwellings in Bani Sa'd, her journey was very slow. And she couldn't find a baby of someone who was rich. Uh, Muhammad's father died, so she didn't take 
she didn't want to take an orphan because she said the, the father would not give me money. But she didn't find another baby to, to take care of. So she took Muhammad. And when they're in, on their way back, the journey was the fastest one. <laughs> So, of course, th this hadith uh, belongs to the tradition of miracle hadiths, the, the hadith that uh, 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 tell how particular Muhammad was. So the question is, why did the jinni go very quickly in her way back when there was Muhammad uh, uh, on her uh, back? Was it joy because she got someone special and she f felt more uh, uh, energy to, uh, to, to do something uh, as being the fastest. So animals have a kind of um, innate feeling and innate understanding of what happens. Now, there is another story of a camel, or uh, sometimes it is one camel, sometimes it is two camels, also in the same genre of uh, miracles uh, stories. Uh, there was a camel who went berserk and, and uh, erupted in, in, a, in a furious rage. And the owners didn't know what to do with that camel. They imprisoned him in, a, in, a, in a, a garden. And they asked for the prophet to come and to soothe him and calm him. And the prophet, as soon as he entered the garden, the camel came in and bowed to him in deference. <laughs> so, does the camel have a, fe a feeling of deference? Uh, now, the, the third one is a very interesting one. It is Safina. Safina is uh, one of the servants of the Prophet. And after the Prophet died, he went, uh, he, he got lost somewhere in a, in a, in a journey. And he found himself away from his other uh, uh, companions. And he was uh, not far from a forest or something, and there was a lion there. And when he saw the lion, he told him, you know, I'm Safina, the prophet's servant. <laughs> and he said, the lion was happy to see me, and he showed me the way to go back to uh, where my other countrymen were. So this one is not a miracle of the prophet, but a miracle of one of his companions, saying that he was the, companions, uh, the, the companion of a prophet, brought him uh, sympathy from the animal. And the, 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 the fourth one, I think I, uh, I already uh, treated. But all these uh, stories, and we can find many more, um, they uh, incite us to think about what implications our actions and our beliefs have on animals. How do they perceive us and how do they feel about us? Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, this is. This is super interesting, um, and I am not very familiar with this with Quran uh, stories or with Christian stories either. But it's it always sounds to me like a lot of it comes in me in metaphorical yes. type of story, and it makes me think um, that. A lot of the time, you know, people will say, oh, animals don't have, yeah, they don't weep or they don't cry or, or they don't laugh or whatever. Um, but it might be that you have, you, you don't have the, cap the capability of understanding it at that time. And th there is, a, I mean, you, you said this at the very beginning of the talk. Um, and it makes me think of a story of, you know, my grandma, told me um, that she had a horse in, in her family, so, so they grew up in a farm. And animal, they, you know, they loved their animals, but the kind of things that my grandma tells me includes um, 
not very nice treatment of animals. Oh. And, and, but you know, they still thought that they were caring for them and loving them in some way. But there was this horse and the horse would not allow anyone else to feed, to feed them. Um, they would not let anyone else to ride him. It was just my grandma. Mm. And it's kind of like a cheesy story, <laughs> but it, it makes me think of this, you know, the horse was unhappy with everyone else. It was moody, it did not let them touch him, um, but it allowed my grandma to even ride him. Um, so I think there is something there in, in how, yeah, in what you're saying, in how we treat animals, that it might just be, I don't know, that we don't understand them yet. And I appreciate this story, so yeah, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. This. Yeah, I, I think that for me, for example, it's difficult to say I love cats or I love dogs, because there are some cats that I love and there are <laughs> that they don't, and there are some dogs that, I think it is also important to recognize the individuality of each animal within its own species. And uh, I think animals do treat us also as individuals uh, you have a cat in, in a room, uh, the cat will feel some, some, somebody as being nice to him and he will be nice to that person uh, back. And, and uh, sometimes it will just hide when, when someone enters the, the, the room. So I really think that we have also to change the, the way of seeing things from the uh, um, generalization of communities into individuali individualities. This is my opinion. I don't know if, what you think about that. I'm, I'm going to take uh, Chair's prerogative um, and, and just draw on, on something that we were talking about beforehand where you were saying that um, in Islam you believe that animals have souls yes. and, and that they are aware of God. Um, I, I wonder if this is why perhaps this, this conversation about animals having emotions is, is easier to have from an Islamic perspective where there is perhaps a more generalised agreement that animals are connected to God and I think quite a few of the conversations we've been having during this conference have been more about you know oh are animals in that same space whereas it, it feels a bit more like that like Islam is coming from it from quite a different perspective saying well they are so therefore the uh, the question about emotion is a different question and I would say so my question is do you think viewing animals as having emotions ties into the fact that you, you, you've granted them that, that uh, relationship to God? Uh, I think that what I presented here is um, the majority point of view. Mm. You still have some theologians that deny uh, souls to uh, um, animals and they, who have a little problem with the text like that, the, the final judgment, yeah, uh, and uh, will say, well, the, that will happen very quickly, and then uh, the, the, the first creatures to be judged are animals, and then we are done with it, and then we move to humans, <laughs> you know? The, that, that point is just to illustrate uh, the... Uh, the extreme justice of God, you know, he never le leaves anything uh, uh, uneven. Um, now, for me, the, the point of emotions in animals uh, is m more exactly a, um, a consequence of being like the, the, this verse said, nations like you, communities like you. Uh, also, the question of a soul and a, a, a body is a tricky one uh, because many theologians still believe that humans have a higher form of soul. <laughs> you, you know, yeah, um, actually, the, um, there is a tension in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Islamic sources between two points of view. The one that considers humanity as superior to all other beings, and the ones that considers humanity equal or less uh, important than the other uh, uh, creatures. So there is this tension, because of course, 
Uh, Adam was uh, created, it is said, directly by God's hand and the uh, spirit was insufflated in him directly. So, the, and there is a, a, a verse, we have unnoblished humankind. So th there is a nobility that is granted to humankind over the, the other species. But in the same Quran, you find descriptions of disbelievers telling they are astray, they are more astray than beasts. So people can be inferior to beasts <laughs> if the, the people uh, do not have uh, this uh, um, uh, belief, what, what, the, the, the belief of, in true monotheism. So the question of emotions, I think, is um, an implication of the individualities of these. Because they can have souls and behave all like robots, but they don't. It is because they are individuals that they interact with things differently. And my point is, even, uh, not today, but even with angels, it's the same. Many people think that angels just obey to God in a, uh, in, in a way that robots do uh, execute orders. But they have individualities also. So th th this is a, a very interesting um, question, I think. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And I, I will round it up there because I'm aware of time. But, but thank you ever so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.